Fiona Fletcher-Smith is Group Director for Development at LNQ, one of the country's largest housing associations with plans to build 100,000 homes over the next 10 years. From 2011 to 2012, Fiona was the Executive Director for Development, Enterprise and Environment at the Greater London Authority. Now, the NLA has recently opened its Changing Face of London exhibition, which looks at how the capital has accommodated growth over the last 15 years. So, uh, Fiona, as you look back on your time at the GLA, what, what were the sort of key challenges and successes during that period? Well, Peter, I think the, the first thing to remember is that when Boris Johnson became mayor and I joined about nine months later, we were in the midst of a banking crisis. So we were, we, we thought we were going off a cliff in terms of London's productivity and what was going to happen. So one of the, the great thrusts from Boris and the team was about economic regeneration and how we were going to keep the capital in its, its ranking as a global city. Um, so a lot of energy and effort went into that. There's potentially a downside in, in that I think we were, we were pushing growth too much in some areas. Um, you know, we can look at some of the master planning and opportunity area areas that, that we set out and you can ask questions about Vauxhall Nine Elms, how successful is that going to be as a place? But at the time, it was really about London's economy and London's jobs. And, and that was fascinating. The other thing that has been really interesting over the, the 15 years that the NLA has been around is the, the complexity of London government. It, it hasn't got any easier. Um, it's not quite as complex as the health service in London and how the governance of that works, but the relationship between City Hall and the London boroughs um, has been at times quite difficult, but I think during my nine years, having come from um, one of the London boroughs, Hackney, um, I was very determined that my team particularly would engage positively with boroughs and try and supplement the lack of experience and skills that they often had in strategic planning. So, you know, some, some of my wonderful planners like Colin Wilson and others would work really, really closely with, with boroughs. And you know, Colin went off to work for Southwark um, on helping them form their thinking about placemaking and um, strategic planning. And, and we kept that right across the various teams. So in terms of regeneration and economic development with Debbie Jackson in those days, it was really about making sure that, that we had a positive working relationship with the boroughs. And it wasn't just diktats coming from City Hall, left, right and centre. And I think that, that was, has been one of the successes. I think it also gave boroughs some confidence that could get them back into council house building, for example, because they knew that there was support from City Hall in the days of Boris and particularly under Sadiq to, to really help them, them grow. And one of the um, couple of things I was thinking about that I was sort of most proud of during those years was um, two projects, the Outer London Fund. So again, if we cast our mind back to 2008-9, we were very concerned about the, the town centres in London and how they were going to fare. We were seeing some really inappropriate residential development in some of these towns um, and, and really retail not, not being able to shift into what the residents of those areas wanted or needed. So the work of the Outer London Fund really shone a light on some brilliant things going on locally um, and set up a network then of local authorities particularly where the GLA could help share best practice around various town centres. So that was fantastic. And then the other thing was it, it's, it's something that people um, haven't always been very conscious of, but public practice led by Finn Williams, that spun out of City Hall. And that spun out of this point I made earlier about a recognition that local government particularly has been denuded of resources for a decade of austerity and simply didn't have the bandwidth of brain power or whatever to be able to engage really proactively in the planning system. And Finn's genius idea in public practice, we were able to support that. Um, and that is going from strength to strength about getting resources in when they're needed locally. And it's been brilliant and long may it last and, and flourish. 
I gather from Finn, he's now going national, which is brilliant. Very good. But you must have been quite excited by uh, being a part of the Olympics, and which was delivered by uh, uh, Boris Johnson, which seemed to give London a, a sort of can-do attitude. Perhaps a bit of that mojo has gone now, but uh, it was an exciting period, wasn't it? It, it was amazing. It, it was it was the best time to be a Londoner. It, it really was. It, it was that, that sense that as a global city, we were very comfortable in our own skin. We were open. We were welcoming. We, we celebrated the diversity of London itself and of the people coming to visit, you know, the cultural work that went along with that, the edgy in the city. Um, and, you know, little things like people were happy and polite on the tube. <laughs> it was during that sort of three month period, it was just absolutely wonderful. And it has been very, very sad to see, as we see from various indicators, increase in hate crime of, of all sorts and, and London sort of moving away from that wonderful feeling of being inclusive and welcoming. Um, and that makes me very, very sad. Um, it is, you know, in terms of the built environment, my office is based in Stratford and the Olympic Park really is, is, is lasting and is used and engages with people in, in the local boroughs. So in a physical sense, we have, we have an excellent legacy. I don't think we quite punched our weight in, um, in terms of the socioeconomic legacy of, of the Olympics. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in, in the host boroughs in, in East London. Um, but in physical senses, the park, I'm, I'm still desperately proud to have been part of that. But I would love to see us, that, that welcoming, opening, open city again. It would be super. Now, perhaps we, we can just turn to um, Ellen Q and what, what you're doing uh, today. Uh, so the, the government is once again really pushing the idea of modern methods of construction. So uh, how, how are you embracing those policies at uh, l &Q? Well, we hope within five years to have 100% um, of our new homes will have an element of offsite manufacture, not the entire home, because that, you know, that's still a difficult process in urban areas. We build all of our homes outside London, our um, so far commissioned um, from Stuart Mill, who do a closed panel timber frame system. We are part of a research project with uh, Barrett's, uh, University of Dundee and Innovate UK and Stuart Mill to, to really test the boundaries of the build programme where we are reducing it by almost 50%. So we, we, we're real fans of MMC. We are still struggling, though, to find a system that we, we uh, can get working in dense urban areas like London. Um, so we are still auditioning, I would say, uh, various players. But there's some fantastic things going on. The um, Tideway development for Greystar in East Croydon is just stunning. I, you know, fairly geeky about these things. And I would stand in the street in East Croydon and watch them winching in. I think they, they were able to winch in six flats every day it was, it was just wonderful wonderful and it's now looks almost complete and it is beautiful and that's that involved hta architects just you know great great collaboration uh, so we're very interested in in that sort of product for us um and we we're just we we're getting ourselves ready we with mmc we spent some time looking inward uh, trying to figure out what did l q build over the last few years and we found things like even on a one bedroom two person home we had 15 different size bathrooms and, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question <laughs> there's you know you can change the shape of it but essentially bath wash and basin loo what more is there um so it's trying to standardize some of those back office sort of functions in the house building industry is brilliant. And also I'm, I'm a massive um, advocate of trying to get more diversity into construction. Um, and I think in l &Q we're doing really well with um, the number of women who we have working for us and, and in senior positions. Um, but MMC also gives you an opportunity to broaden the number of people who can work in construction. So, for example, a factory can work on a shift pattern that allows people with caring responsibilities to, to actually be part of a construction um, company. So really, really keen on, on that aspect of it. And then if, if 
um, as I think I was quoted somewhere the other week saying, I think it's a great opportunity if the government can get their heads around this to join up the policy dots of needing more housing, needing an answer to um, collapsing manufacturing in parts of Britain um, and th this issue of labour shortages um, and quality in the industry. You can put all of those things together. They don't all sit with one minister, unfortunately, but you put them all together together and you have an industrial strategy that actually talks to the housing strategy for the country. Um, so I live in hope that someone's going to listen to that. But also, of course, um, COVID-19 is having an, an impact on the housing market at the moment. There are reports that the sale of apartments is flatlining while houses are booming. People are moving out to the suburbs. Uh, what, what, what do you see as the longer term impact of covid on the design and the location of new homes? Um, I don't think it's as simple as, as apartments are flatlining. Um, I'm seeing quite a bit of a boom at the moment, um, but then I aim at the first time buyer market because shared ownership is, is a huge uh, product for us. Um, and what we found once the market reopened was there is an immense spike, spike in demand. And if you can imagine lockdown for those three months, if you were locked down in a shared home where, you know, every time you opened the fridge, some nicked your milk again, the first thing you've got to want to do is see if you can go and find your own home. And what shared ownership is, is brilliant for is, is it reduces the amount of a deposit you have to pay because you're only paying a deposit on the um, share you're buying. So far more accessible to people in London. So we, we are seeing high demand. But then for LNQ, we took a strategic decision about three years ago to pull out of central London. Um, and we are we build now zone three and four and, and five and six and places like Barking Riverside. Um, we've seen 100 people chasing each single home for sale. Um, and that's that's fantastic. There will be an element of this, which is about the rush to beat the stamp duty holiday changes or help to buy. Um, so what the long term means is is difficult. But where, where, where it's also pushing our thinking, and, and this is something that was going on anyway, and it is the right thing to do, is, is about access to space. So creating some flexible spaces within our floor plan plans. So, for example, some of the homes we build in Milton Keynes have a spare room, small, that can be used for a study or a playroom or somewhere to, for their kids to homeschool that isn't the kitchen table. Um, and that flexibility is really valued by people who, who move into our homes. And also about access to space. Now, I was desperately lucky during lockdown. I've got a garden. I could sit in my garden. Um, so if I didn't feel confident about using the many parks in South London, I, I still had access to, to green space. And I think that's really, really, really important. It always has been, um, but I think now people are far more conscious of it. And if you, if you read one of the Sunday papers during lockdown of a, a woman in um, a tower in Vauxhall Nine Elms describing what it felt like to be locked down in, in, in effect in the sealed box, so we've got to think more about how people get access to some kind of leisure space. Uh, you mentioned Barking Riverside. I mean, this is one of your larger schemes and was in your portfolio while you were at the GLA as well, wasn't it? That's uh, taken some time to get off the ground. It, it's beginning to really move now, is it? It is, Peter, and I'd, I'd urge you to um, take your Brompton out there and have a look around because it is absolutely buzzing. So what we've had to do at Barking is obviously put in a lot of infrastructure. And uh, the thing that is giving me most joy at the moment is you can see the embankment for the train link. It is coming. The station box is being built. Um, there are red London buses driving around and you can get from uh, Barking Station out to Barking Riverside really quickly on the E1, E2 and E3. Brilliant. It, it just looks like a proper place now. It's amazing. Um, the seals are still on the foreshore, uh, foreshore there and we have a family of swans with two baby cygnets. So it is the most adorable place to go. Um, but yeah, now that the infrastructure's in, our next stage is to really look at the town centre that is going to be around the station um, and think about how, how do we um, activate that early 
with some commercial uses that don't yet have the hinterland. So there's there's that sort of balance that, that we're going to have to strike there. Um, I might take a, a lesson from the late and wonderful Tony Pidgeley, that when he was at creating Kidbrook, one of the things that they did was a sort of a subsidised package for a major retailer to go in first, for example. And I think that's really important. Um, so, yeah, get out to Barking, see the train line coming. Very good. Certainly do that. So uh, what has been your response to uh, the government's uh, planning for the future uh, changes that uh, are out for consultation? Uh, I mean, in particular, uh, set changes to Section 106 and the funding of affordable housing. Yeah. We're, we have expressed concern about this. We, we generally, as a sector, we, we think this has the danger of reducing the amount of affordable housing produced through the system. Uh, we have concerns about the uh, shared ownership proposals. Um, and, and Peter, there's, there's always this, this tinkering with the planning system. And every time it's suggested that this is going to be a once in a generation game changing event, um, but you've still got really worrying things in there around permitted development. Um, I worry about town centres. Um, I worry that real care has to be taken. You cannot just change shops and offices into resi willy-nilly. We've seen some dreadful quality come out of that. Um, but the two things that, that I've always felt needed fixing were, first of all, how do people engage with the planning? system and I do think they're having a go at that within this um, I, I do hope they press on with that aspect of it certainly because you and I know it's it's people like me middle age middle class know the system I'm the person most likely to send an email to the council about a planning application now in my case in, in Bromley it's 99 percent in favour of, of the, the building, um, but that isn't always the case in, in London boroughs. And how do we engage with, with a wider cross-section of people? The thing that always bothered me was if, if you lived in a North London borough, you were homeless, and say, for example, you were housed in that dreadful tower block, block out in Harlow, and then somebody was, was applying to build some homes in your borough, how do you, where are you in this conversation? You're in desperate housing need, but it's the people who are very adequately housed who are the ones objecting because, you know, it's just going to affect your view or the value of your property, perceived value of your property. So that, that's, I hope, I hope they get something that engages better with people. And then it, it's back to an earlier point that I made in relation to Finn Williams' work on public practice. It's, the problems with the planning system are often about resource and lack of it. So when I hit hurdles with the planning system, it's usually because a planning officer has left or a planning officer is ill and there isn't enough resource to backfill that. And it, it's the process that, that is wrong. Um, but yeah, bu building beautiful, I can't argue with that, surely. Mm. Um, <laughs> what the perception of beauty is, you probably can argue about. Um, but stop tinkering and um, yeah, recognize that you could actually reduce the amount of affordable housing here. Uh, just one last question. Uh, you, you, you said that uh, you, you stopped uh, developing in central London, uh, but uh, are you developing elsewhere in England at the moment? And what are the places that might say are gonna challenge London in the future as, we, as the government rebalances the economy? So we, in um, October last year, so this time last year, we acquired Trafford Housing Trust in the Northwest, an absolutely wonderful organisation and you know, culturally fantastic fit for us. Uh, so we're very actively building now from the Lancashire-Cumbria borders, Preston's a big place for us, right down through, through Cheshire. Um, and that's been, that has been fantastic. Um, I don't think we're yet seeing the evidence of the levelling up agenda in terms of resource going into areas like the Midlands or the Northwest yet. So I'm keen to understand what what the Homes England prospectus, for example, is going to, to say and do to help that. Um, I worry that, that uh, a lot of money can get pumped into housing, but for me what has to go with it is um, the vibrancy of the economy. 
Um, so, for example, I, I was asked to look at um, helping in Blackpool around the poor housing situation in Blackpool. Um, and the, the real problem in Blackpool is, is, frankly, there are no jobs. And, and once the big political parties stopped having their conferences in, Bright, in Blackpool, um, the, the, there was no sort of trade to, to keep people actively employed. Because they, those conferences, although they last for a week, they, they have a huge supply chain that, that is generally locally based and supplying them. Um, so I do, I do think, back to this other point, you've got to join those government agendas of our industrial strategy, where's, where's work going to happen with housing and housing improvement. But no, we love working in the Northwest. And we're doing an awful lot in the Midlands. Um, Milton Keynes has been a fantastic area for us. Uh, I think there we are benefiting from people realising they can work from home more often. So either the cost or time of commuting is less of an issue. So living somewhere like Milton Keynes, um, Bedfordshire. Um, and we own quite a bit of land along the Oxford-Cambridge Arc. So we're, we're looking forward to doing a lot, of, uh, a lot more work there in that area. Um, and hopefully working with the grain of those, those local places to, to come up with a, a vernacular that works for the local communities under the Building Beautiful banner. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. So we're not in the Northeast yet and we're not in the Southwest. So, <laughs> but everywhere else you'll find LNQ. Good. So plenty to do. And uh, so Fiona, thank you very much indeed for your insights and uh, sharing them with us. So uh, I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter.